Good morning. I'm Melissa Harris Perry. This week, as Congress continues to be entangled in the now usual Washington gridlock, the junior senator from Texas is cruising right on through. Republican Senator Ted Cruz has taken his one man show on the road with a sold out performance that killed Friday night before an audience of 600 at the Republican Party of Iowa's fall Ronald Reagan commemorative dinner. It was Cruz's first visit to the state since the 21 hour talkathon that propelled him into political infamy among his fellow Republicans and into the political stratosphere among his Tea Party base. Tea Party crowds have since devoured Cruz's message of the little guy resistance to big government tyranny. And at Friday night's dinner, he served them up a hefty slice. I'm convinced we're facing a new paradigm in politics. It is a paradigm that is the rise of the grassroots. I got to tell you, it has official Washington absolutely terrified. Now, while Senator Cruz has consistently avoided the 2016 will he or won't he question in the press, his appearance on Friday was his third visit in as many months to the first in the nation caucus state of Iowa. And although Cruz may not yet want to go near the question of his White House aspirations, he certainly put himself in close proximity to the gigantic GOP elephant in the room. The answer we saw in 1980 was a grassroots revolution. It was the Reagan revolution. It was millions of Americans, many of the men and women in this room who stood up, who got involved and said, we're going to get back to the principles that made this nation great. In attempting to cover himself in the cape of the GOP's conservative crusader, Ted Cruz is joining in on the Republican Party's ongoing bromance with our nation's 40th president. Ronald Reagan rode into the White House in 1981 on a 44-state landslide victory and was re-elected in 1984 by 49 states. Today, he continues to be one of the most popular presidents more than two decades after he left office. A 2011 poll gave him the third highest approval ranking among presidents of the last 50 years behind John F. Kennedy and Bill Clinton. It's the kind of popularity that is but a distant memory for the Republican Party today and that continues to fuel GOP nostalgia for the Reagan era. But that's the thing about nostalgia for the past. It tends to obscure some of the facts of history something Republicans longing for the golden days of the Gipper might want to remember. Because returning to Reagan Republicanism might require today's GOP to make a few adjustments to their party line. Like that whole tax cuts thing? Yeah, that's got to go. Sure, Reagan's 1981 tax cut, the single largest in American history at the time, is the kind of policy that Republicans can only fantasize about today. But President Reagan also passed the single largest tax increase since 1968 during his first term. In fact, Reagan would ultimately raise taxes 11 times while he was in office and clutch the Republican pearls because one of those tax hikes, the 1983 payroll tax increase, went to pay for Social Security and Medicare. That is right. Ronald Reagan raised taxes to pay for <gasps> government run health care. By the way, how married are you to that small government ideology? Because during Reagan's eight years in office, federal spending increased by an annual average of 2.5 percent adjusted for inflation. And the national debt, well, that tripled from 700 billion to nearly three trillion dollars. Republicans longing for the 80s might also want to get going on immigration policy because in 1982, Ronald Reagan signed a bill that made any immigrant who had entered the country before that year eligible for amnesty and helped three million people become American citizens. Oh, your whole conservative Christian war on women might want to call that off too, because Ronald Reagan may have been more than willing to hop on the Southern strategy states rights bandwagon, but he was not one to bring God along for the ride. And although he spoke about his opposition to abortion, he never introduced a bill to oppose reproductive rights. And he actually helped the cause by appointing Supreme Court justices Sandra Day O'Connor and Anthony Kennedy, who joined in the majority opinion in the case upholding Roe v. Wade. Now, let's be clear, none of this is to suggest that Reagan was a champion of using the power of government to help the little guy. Those exploding deficits and growing government receipts were caused by bolstering, bolstering the Pentagon and unleashing jaw-dropping defense spending, even as America's chief rival, the Soviet Union, was becoming less threatening. And Reagan was largely indifferent to the problem of cities and the needs of the poor during the golden years of the current that the current Republican Party yearns for. Economic inequality widened, home ownership declined, 
and the Justice Department largely refused to investigate or prosecute rampant racial discrimination in housing. These realities are why some of us still call the Washington, D.C. airport national. And yet, despite the painful and contradictory realities that marked the Reagan years, the man did something that current Republican leadership has wholly proved incapable of doing. He governed despite having different parties control the White House and the House of Representatives. Perhaps the most useful truth about Reagan for a modern Republican party, party wondering what would Ronnie do can be found in his relationship with his greatest political adversary, Democratic Speaker of the House Tip O'Neill. The two men were ideological opponents who still managed to govern and compromise in the national interests.